I am Dr. Fuzi Slisli, and today I will be talking to you about Shakespeare's Theatre, Shakespeare's Theatre Group, which became very famous and uh, toured all over England, and which was responsible for performing uh, almost all of Shakespeare's plays. Uh, so I want to talk to you today a little bit about uh, their characteristics, what kind of theatres they performed in, what kind of plays who acted and who wrote and things like that. Before um, we begin, we need to know a little bit about uh, the uh, uh, stage culture that existed before Shakespeare's time. So before Shakespeare's time, and when he was still a boy, groups of actors performed wherever they could. Yani, there were no theaters, there were no stages. The uh, groups of um, actors performed in halls, in courts, in courtyards, in gardens, and any other available open spaces. In 1574, however, when Shakespeare was 10 years old, the Common Council, uh, in Baladia, passed a law requiring plays and theatres in London to be licensed. Yeah, I mean, they wanted to give licenses to theatres to be built. In 1576, Actor and future Lord Cham Chamberlain's man, um, James Burbage, built the first permanent theatre called simply the Theatre. So this is the first permanent theatre. It's a building, the first building theatre that was built in 1576, and it was simply called the Theatre. And it was built outside London's city walls. Thereafter, Many more theatres were established around the city of London, including the Globe Theatre, in which most of Shakespeare's plays were performed. Um, you will see some images will be provided to you in the uh, PowerPoint presentations that show you the type of uh, stages that were used in Shakespeare's dramas, or an image of the Curtain Theatre, uh, which was... Um, uh, uh, was built some 200 yards outside the city walls of London. This was the first one, it was one of the very first ones. It was built about 200 yards outside the walls of London. And uh, uh, the Curian Theatre also housed many of Shakespeare's plays. Um, Elizabethan theatres were generally built after the design of the original theatre. The first building was just called the theatre, and the buildings that were built after that usually followed the same design. They were built of wood. They, they weren't built out of, um, you know, uh, stone or bricks. They were built of wood. Uh, these theatres comprised three rows of seats in a circular shape, with the stage area on one side of the circle, uh, the audience's seat and part of the stage were roofed, right? The audience's seat and part of the stage were roofed, they had a roof, but much of the main stage and the area in front of the stage was open to, you know, the rain and the sun and so on. Uh, about 1,500, that's uh, 1,500 audience members, could pay an extra fee to sit in the covered sitting areas where it's protected from the rain and the sun, while about 500 uh, groundlings, they were called groundlings, they were standing spectators, paid less to stand in the open area before the stage. So notice the first, first of all, the numbers. I mean... 1,500 seats <coughs> in the areas that are covered from the rain and the sun. And then an extra 800 people could stand up and be exposed to the rain and the sun. That gives us 2,300 people in, you know, one theater performance. That is pretty big for, you know, the Renaissance. And what it says is that the theater was a means of mass communication. It wasn't uh, like today. I think there were much more people studying plays in those days and watching plays than there are today. Um, the stage itself was divided into three levels. There is a main stage area 
with doors at the rear and a curtained area in the back for discovery scenes. An upper canopied decorated cover with clothes uh, area called heaven for balcony scenes and an area under the stage called hell. So these are the stage areas basically with where they performed the scenes. Um, there were dressing rooms uh, located behind the stage, just behind the stage, but no curtain in the front. There was no curtain uh, in front of the stage, which meant that the scenes had to flow into each other, right? Because they don't like bring down the curtain to change the scene and then start another scene. It just flows into uh, the old scene, and if there is dead bodies, they had to be dragged and, and so on. Performances took place during the day, using natural light from the open uh, <clears throat> center of the theater. So there was no lighting, um, there was no electricity, of course, and they didn't use torches or the plays weren't performed at night, they were performed during the day. At least this is in the uh, public uh, performances that, are, that were open to the public, but of course they were also performances in the palaces, in the courts, and in the mansions of rich people. Um, <clears throat> since there could be no dramatic lighting, there was very little scenery or props. There was no decor as such, scenery or props. The objects and furniture used in the play, uh, so audiences relied on the actors' lines, on the words, on the dialogue, and the stage directions, to supply the time of day and year, as well as the weather, the location, and the mood. All that information, it was provided through the dialogue and through the, uh, the words of the actors. Shakespeare's plays convey such information masterfully. For example, in Hamlet, the audience learns within the first ten lines of the dialogue where the scene takes place have you had a quiet guard right this is the line and the audience learn what time of day it is t is now struck 12 the line in hamlet says and also the line in hamlet says tells us what the weather is like uh, t is bitter cold the text of hamlet says and what mood the characters are in the character in hamlet says and I am sick at heart, right? So the dialogue provides all this information that today is provided through the scenery, the lighting, the decoration, and so on. One important difference between plays written in Shakespeare's time and those written in that, uh, and, and those written today, is that Elizabethan plays were published after the performances, and sometimes even after their author's death. The scripts were in many ways a record of what happened on stage during performances rather than directions for what should happen. Actors were allowed to suggest changes to scenes so the actor could say, you know, they could change the scenes or suggest changes to the scene if they wanted to. Um, and dialogue and had much more freedom with their parts than contemporary actors today. Today, contemporary actors, they are given a part and they have to learn it and perform it. In those days, the actor could suggest changes to their parts and so on. A scene illustrative of such freedom, this freedom that the actor has, you find it in Hamlet, where a crucial passage in Hamlet revolves around Hamlet writing his own scene to be added to a play, because there is a play that's performed in Hamlet, in order to ensnare, meaning to gain power over somebody by using dishonest means, in order because Hamlet wanted to ensnare his murderous uncle. So he writes his own uh, scene and adds it to the play and uses it to ensnare his own uncle. Shakespeare's plays were published in various forms and with a wide range of accuracy during his time. The discrepancies between versions of his plays from one publication to the next make it difficult for editors to put together 
authoritative editions. We don't know which one of these versions is the most authentic. Uh, plays could be published in large anthologies, like folios, right? Uh, folios format. The first folio of Shakespeare contains 36 plays, and it remains the foundation of uh, what we call the Shakespeare, Shakespeare's plays are mostly taken from this folio that was published in, I think, 1616 and contained 36 plays and is simply known as the first folio of Shakespeare. Or plays could be published in smaller quartos. Folios were so named because of the way their paper was folded in half to make a large volume. Quartos were smaller in size uh, cheaper books and they contained only one play so there was one play per quarto their paper was folded twice making it four pages right in general the first folio is considered to be uh, more reliable than the quartos although Shakespeare's language and classical references seem archaic old to many readers today they were accessible to his contemporary audiences. I mean, the language in Shakespeare's play sound difficult today, but to his contemporaries, they were accessible and easy to understand. His views came from all classes, and his plays appealed to all kinds of sensibilities, from highbrow high accounts of kings and queens to the lowbrow blunderings of clowns and servants. Even utterly tragic plays like King Lear or Macbeth contain a clown or fool to provide comic relief and to comment on the events of the play. Audiences would also have been familiar with his numerous references to classical mythology and literature since these stories were staples and essential parts of the Elizabethan knowledge base. These uh, references to classical uh, plays, for example, Seneca's plays, the Roman poet Seneca. So references to Seneca were common because this was part of the education curriculum of the Renaissance. And yet, despite such a universal appeal, um, Shakespeare's plays <coughs> uh, also expand on the audience's vocabulary. Many uh, phrases and words that we use today, such as amazement, such as in my mind's eye and the milk of human kindness to name only a few these words were coined by Shakespeare his plays contained indeed a great variety and number of words than almost any other work in the English language Shakespeare was responsible for uh, inventing so many new words into the English language in uh, uh, the next session, we will uh, look at Shakespeare's play Macbeth, and I just want to give you a brief uh, account of Macbeth. Macbeth, uh, it's a, a, a legend, for example, legend says that Macbeth was written in 1605 and 1606 and performed at Hampton Court in 1606 for King James I and his brother-in-law, King Christian of Denmark. Whether it was first performed at the Royal Court or was performed at the Globe Theatre, uh, there can be little doubt that the play was intended to please the King, who had recently became the patron of Shakespeare's theatrical company. Who, um, we note, for example, that the character of Banco, the legendary root of the Stuart family tree, that's where the uh, Stuart family tree comes from, is depicted very favorably. Like Banco, King James was a steward. The play is also quite pretty short, because perhaps because Shakespeare knew that James, King James, preferred short plays. And the play contains many supernatural elements that James, who himself published a book on the detection and practices of witchcraft, would have 
appreciated. Again, we come, uh, uh, we deal with the question of witchcraft and superstition during the reference. You notice what a popular subject it was. We find that the King James was himself very interested in witchcraft and superstition, and the play Macbeth has a central component about witches. Even something as minor as the Scottish defeat of the Danes may have been omitted uh, to avoid offending King Christian. The material for Macbeth was drawn from Raphael Hollinshed's Chronicles of England, Scotland and Ireland, written in 1587. It's a chronicle, kind of like a book of history, but it's not quite history because it doesn't follow the uh, strict rules of historical writing. So it's uh, chronicles. And the material for Macbeth is taken from there. Despite, despite the play's historical source, uh, Macbeth is generally classified as a, as a tragedy rather than a history. This, deri this derives perhaps from, from the fact that the story contains many historical fabrications. Shakespeare wasn't interested, uh, he didn't stick to historical truth. He wanted to create fiction and write a tragedy. So he took liberties with the facts, including the entire character of Banco, who was invented by a 16th century Scottish historian in order to validate the Stuart family line. In addition to such fictionalization, Shakespeare took many liberties with the original story, manipulating the characters of Macbeth and Duncan to suit his purposes. In Hollinshed's court, Macbeth is a ruthless and valiant leader who rules competently, com competently, competently uh, after killing Duncan. So Macbeth kills Duncan and he becomes a ruler and he rules ruthlessly. Where, whereas Duncan is portrayed as a young <coughs> and soft-willed man, Shakespeare draws out certain aspects of the two characters in order to create a stronger sense of polarity. Whereas Duncan is made out to be a venerable and kindly older, older king, Macbeth is transformed into an indecisive and troubled young man who cannot possibly rule well. Macbeth is certainly not only a play with historical themes that is full of fabrications, indeed there are other reasons why the play is considered a tragedy rather than a history. One reason lies in the play's universality. Rather than illustrating a specific historical moment, Macbeth presents a human drama of ambitions, which means that uh, anyone reading it anywhere in the world could recognize questions and problems of ambition, desire, and guilt. Like Hamlet, Macbeth speaks soliloquies that articulate the emotional and intellectual anxieties with which many audiences identify pretty easier, easily. For all his lack of values and vaulting ambitions, Macbeth is a character who often seems indefinitely real uh, to audiences. <clears throat> this powerful grip on the audience is perhaps what has made Macbeth such a popular play for centuries of viewers. Given that Macbeth is one of Shakespeare's shortest plays, some scholars have suggested that scenes were excised, they were cut uh, or removed from the folio version and they were subsequently lost. There are some loose ends and non sequiturs in the text of the play that would seem to support such claim. If scenes were indeed cut out, however, these cuts were most masterfully done. After all, none of the storyline is lost and the play remains incredibly powerful without them. In fact, the play's length gives it a compelling, almost brutal force. The action flows from scene to scene, speech to speech, with a swiftness that draws the viewer into Macbeth's struggles. As Macbeth's world spins out of control, the play itself also begins to spiral towards uh, to, to its uh, violent end. Um, so this basically is uh, uh, a 
brief lecture on Shakespeare's theater and an introduction to his play Macbeth. It gives you a, some insight and information about the uh, context and the background in which Shakespeare's theater performed, how they wrote their plays, where they brought their material from, the subject that they used to write their plays from historical chronicles, for example, as in the case of Macbeth, and a little, uh, 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 a little summary of the play Macbeth, which we will talk about in our next lecture, inshallah. And this brings us to the end of this lecture. Thank you very much for following. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa ta'ala wa barakatuh.